think of ourselves as the most powerful beings in the universe, it's unsettling to discover that we're wrong. Time has come to see the world as it is. Can we pull back the veil of static and reach into the source of all being? Behind this hurt, this random pattern generated, you will be responsible for an escalation that will destroy everything. In this episode, I'm going to be getting to another fascinating aspect of the spirit parasite extraction experiences, one which I have been mostly unwilling to share with other people. I just know that most people will unfortunately think that I'm either lying or insane talking about this stuff, but my spirit contacts have urged me to share these things on this podcast. I know that many other occultists and practitioners understand and relate to working with spirits and deities, but they aren't the only kinds of beings which have been working with me. Some of the beings I've experienced and who have helped me in extracting parasites are what we would call aliens. I already mentioned the little earth being and the Nordic type, but over the course of the extraction procedures, I came to find myself perceiving, meeting, and interacting with many other types of alien beings. Most of them were very similar to descriptions of beings typical in abduction experiences, but others were not. I met a very tall being, about eight feet tall, which had a very large head and large eyes. It was wearing a sort of robe or gown, it very much resembled descriptions of the tall greys of UFO lore. It gave me its name, or the closest sound a human can make to resemble its name. It communicated to me phonetically how to pronounce it. It was like a series of clicks and sputters. It was like <laughs> that sort of thing. All right, here is an excerpt from the definition of tall grey alien from the website tallwhitealiens.com. The second prominent race in this group of extraterrestrials are the tall greys, described by Robert Dean as a very large group, I say large, they were six to eight feet, maybe sometimes nine feet tall, and they were humanoid, but they were very pale, very white, didn't have any hair on their bodies at all. Tall greys are described to originate from the Orion constellation, and according to Dr. Arthur Horn, play an overseeing role vis-a-vis -vis short greys. The short greys are overseen within their own ranks by the taller seven to eight foot tall greys. These greys are the ones that actually carry out diplomatic missions, such as secretly negotiating treaties with heads of human governments. As mentioned, the greys in general, and the small three to five foot greys in particular, have been likened to mercenaries. I also met some guys who were of the more typical short grey type as well. They were very gentle and kind. I should mention again that I was perceiving them in the same way I would typically see the spirits and deities. I was not seeing them physically like in almost every case of abduction. Here are some excerpts from the entry on greys from the website Gaia.com. It was written by Christine April. The exact planetary origin of this species is widely believed to be Zeta Reticuli, a wide binary star system in the southern constellation of Reticulum, although there is the possibility that several species of greys exist, originating from different points in the galaxy, such as the Orion system. The greys, it is believed, have been operating on Earth for quite some time. There also exists the possibility that they are a later evolution of the human species, in that overuse of cloning and genetic manipulation has destroyed their DNA and driven them nearly to the point of extinction. This hypothesis could help explain the harvesting of human tissues and prevalence of cattle mutilations as an attempt to refresh their own genetic makeup. Could the greys be collecting these samples to continue cloning themselves? Or is it possible that they are creating a hybrid species, part human, part alien? Regardless of the extent of their involvement on our planet, the greys stand out in their appearance. The most striking characteristic of these beings are their large black almond-shaped eyes, devoid of pupils or irises. Well, I have to make an aside here, there are actually a lot of greys experienced that do have pupils and irises. They have unusually large heads, elongated arms, and seem to lack muscular structure. These beings generally have grey skin, although some are reported as ranging from bluish grey in color to beige or tan and even white. They tend to stand between 3.5 to 6 feet tall, and it appears that their height and skin color reflect their status. The mouth, ears, and nose of the grey species are nearly non-existent. As generally sexless beings, it is believed that they reproduce through cloning technology, while most small greys are thought to be controlled by a hive mind. Hive mind may also be known as swarm intelligence, which is the collective behavior of decentralized, self-organized systems. They are fourth density beings. Greys tend to travel in saucer-shaped, triangular, or spherical craft. Perhaps the greatest mystery of the greys is their agenda and intentions for planet Earth and the humans that inhabit this world. 
It is widely agreed that they seem to be involved in a long-term experiment using the genetic makeup of our species, carefully following and abducting individuals, subjecting them to various tests, and attempting to wipe clean the memories of these frightening experiences. Many claim that the greys communicate through telepathy and often employ mind control when interacting with test subjects. It is said that they can stun and subdue people with their dark and fathomless eyes, implanting memories and rendering abductees immobile. The greys are highly intelligent beings, but appear to value science above spirituality. They seem to run the gamut as far as intentions go. Some greys appear unconcerned with human emotions, viewing us as simple test subjects, while other abductees report a positive and emotional connection during their abductions. It is thought that the greys hold allegiance with several other alien species, either as equals or as a slave class themselves. Abductees have encountered greys that work closely with reptilian entities, and these tend to be malevolent in nature and subservient to the wishes of the reptilians. Others have witnessed greys that seem to be assisting Nordic aliens, another group of aliens known for their peaceful and spiritual nature. Are the greys using humans as a genetic farm, or are they perhaps stewards of our species, tracking and observing our evolution? That's the end of that article. One time, I felt a presence grabbing me and flipping my head around, searching for a parasite, eventually zeroing in on it and pulling it out of my neck. When I perceived the entity doing this, I saw a human-sized insect being, which looked like a praying mantis. Now, many abductees report alien beings which resemble humanoid praying mantises. In the lore, it is said that they were a very ancient race, as insects are on the more primitive end of evolution. That does not mean, however, that they are all malevolent or dangerous. Here are some excerpts from an entry on mantis beings from Gaia.com from the same author. Mantis aliens are perhaps the most mysterious and unsettling of all extraterrestrial creatures. These beings appear within many abduction scenarios, with abductees reporting the ominous presence of these entities looming over their beds as they wake in the dead of night. While the mantis is not as widely reported as the gray or Nordic alien, it still holds an important role within many extraterrestrial contact scenarios. Some researchers have considered mantids as a possible explanation of an early form of intelligent life from planet Earth itself, but this is only one theory of the origin of these creatures. By far the most striking aspect of the mantis alien is its physical kinship with the praying mantis, the carnivorous and bipedal insect of its namesake. Many report these beings as seven to six feet tall with long thin torsos. Their necks, arms, and hands have additional joints. Their heads are insect-like and triangular, with large slanted eyes of deep brown to black. Most mantids are described as dark brown, but other colors such as green and black have also been encountered. Their bodies are composed of a segmented exoskeleton, and some abductees have reported that the mantis seems to be coated in oily substance. They are often encountered wearing long robes in a variety of colors, perhaps signifying rank, while some are unclothed. Although the mantis tend to communicate with human abductees using telepathic messages, they have been witnessed engaging one another using an auditory language. Several contactees have described the mantis language as a series of clicking sounds exchanged between the creatures. The mantis tend to be overseers and often appear to be in leadership positions of power during an abduction. Generally, a mantis will be accompanied by several small gray aliens who seem to be doing its bidding. These small greys are assumed to be drone beings, controlled by a hive mind and utilized by a variety of alien races. The mantis are commonly involved in abductions that include both medical procedure and instances of interrogation. The perceived motivation of them in regards to human abduction is somewhat mysterious. Some contactees describe these creatures as positive, uplifting beings who seek to protect humanity and Earth. One common thread found among many abduction scenarios is centered around the use of holographic projections as a means of education. Abductees often report mantis beings showing them holographic images of the destruction of planet Earth to illustrate the possible negative impact that our species could have upon the planet. Others have reported an increase in psychic abilities post-abduction. Many experiencers claim that the mantids seem to possess the uncanny ability to put abductees at ease, offering telepathic words of comfort that eliminate the fear of an encounter. However, some return from their experiences with the mantids with a darker point of view, stating that they wish to conquer and control Earth rather than aid in human ascension. Some believe that a mantid hybridization program is currently taking place, using human DNA to create a new species. Some abductees report the presence of tall blacks, a creature thought to be such a hybridization. Experiencers describe these beings as incredibly tall and more humanoid than insectoid with black skin, extremely long limbs, and extra joints on their appendages. These abduction scenarios are very similar to those involving mantis aliens and seem to revolve around medical experiments. The most chilling feature of the tall blacks encountered by many abductees are their glowing red eyes. And now, the news. What the hell are going down here? In Finland in 1957, two women claimed to have seen and spoken to the ghost of their president, Dr. Juho Kusti Pasikivi, who had died four months before. 
On 19th of April, they were approaching the elevator in an apartment building in Helsinki on their way to visit someone when they both saw President Pasekivi standing by the elevator door. One of the women, Mrs. E. Sinasalo, opened the door and the president said, in Finnish, of course, After you, ladies, please. Mrs. Sinasalo commented, He looked a little younger and thinner than when I had last seen him, but he still spoke in the big, almost raucous voice for which he was famous. They all got into the elevator and ascended to the fourth floor where, as the door was opened and he began to leave, he said, Ladies, you must certainly be wondering why I am here when I should be in the grave. But it is really so. He left the elevator, and as the two ladies continued up to the next floor, they saw him standing smiling at them through the glass door. It is interesting that the president never operated the elevator himself. Mrs. Sinisalo opened the door at ground level. It had stopped at the fourth floor without anyone pressing the button, and Mrs. Sinisalo again had to open the door for the president to leave. But why did the two ladies not realize immediately on first seeing the president that they were seeing a ghost? They recognized him and must have known he had been dead for four months. Yet Mrs. Sinisalo said later, I did not quite realize that he was a dead man until he announced it himself, but I still think it is curious that neither Aunt Maja nor I remembered when we were in the elevator with him that we knew Pasakivi was dead. On March 2, 1971, at Poundstock Church in Cornwall, Ivor Potter describes his experience as such. For about four minutes, I saw a priest, I assumed, was going to take part in the service, standing behind the vicar in the porch. We even wished each other good afternoon. It was only later I discovered he did not exist. I always thought they were supposed to be misty, gossamer creatures, but the ghost was absolutely solid. He answered me back and I walked all around him. A phantom monk was seen by several people in the 1970s near the old St. John's Church in Chester, and he spoke to at least two of the witnesses. One of these encounters took place in December 1973, when the witness was walking home late at night along a cobbled footpath by the church. Suddenly he saw a monk in a black robe and cowl. The figure spoke in what seemed like German, but although the witness knew German, he could not understand what was said and thinks it may have been a dialect. The man told the monk, whom he had no reason to believe was not a living person, that he could not understand him and the monk seemed upset. The witness walked around him to continue along the path, but immediately thought he ought to try and help him, so he turned around. But there was no one there, and there was nowhere he could have gone so quickly. Even so, the witness refused to believe he had seen a ghost. He wrote to a local newspaper about his experience, and another man replied that he too had had a similar experience when using the path late at night. Quote, When I was about halfway down, I met a man dressed like a monk. In other words, in a black robe and wearing sandals. He spoke to me in some outlandish language which I could not understand, and I said so. He seemed to repeat his request, but it was no use. I didn't understand him. This failure to make himself understood saddened the monk, and he turned away. Again, the witness moved on, then turned to find the monk no longer there. In Linton, Cambridgeshire, beginning in 1971, Matthew Manning, a psychic and healer, saw a ghost on the stairs. He apologized to Matthew for frightening him, and added that he needed to walk to ease the pain in his legs. He allowed Matthew to draw a quick sketch of him before he climbed upstairs and disappeared out of sight on the landing. The following year, Matthew saw him again in one of the bedrooms. He shook hands with him, though he felt nothing, quote, my hand passed straight through his. Again, the ghost complained about his legs. This time, Matthew saw him actually disappear, quote, It was as though I was watching a color television screen from which the color was gradually fading. I noticed that the figure of Robert Webb was losing its color around the edges so that his outer areas were grayish, while the main central areas of his body were still showing color. While I watched, I could see the color vanishing. Within less than 30 seconds, I estimated, all the color had gone, and I was left facing a shadowy gray figure. Then the gray became fainter, and I realized that he was vanishing into the air. Although Matthew did not see the ghost very often, and so was rarely able to communicate face to face, the ghost did write a considerable length through Matthew's hand and answered his questions. Oh, automatic writing. The ghost was also responsible for the writing of hundreds of old signatures on a bedroom wall. Matthew obtained tape recordings of muffled voices and dinnertime noises, complete with belches. The richness and complexity of this case makes it one of the most fascinating. Another case which has certain parallels with Matthew Manning's experiences took place in Doddleston, Cheshire, England, beginning in November 1984. Following poltergeist activity in a cottage that was being renovated, the occupant Ken Webster received a message in the form of a poem on his computer screen. A few weeks later, another message in a late Middle English dialect was found. Quote, what strange words thou speak, although I must confess that I hath also been ill-schooled. Thou art a goodly man, who hath fanciful women who dwell in mine home. T'was a great crime to have bribed mine house. Bribed means stolen. After this, Ken began to reply to the messages, and a lengthy dialogue was opened up with Thomas Harden. 
who claimed to be living in the mid-16th century in the Doddleston Cottage. As well as using the computer, he also wrote messages on blank paper and chalked on the floor. In another Finnish case, uh, which took place on the 12th of February 1977, a woman holding a reception at her flat in Helsinki had among her guests a woman she later discovered to have been a ghost. The guests were celebrating the award of a doctorate to one of their friends, and about 60 people were present. One woman the hostess did not recognize. She wore old-fashioned clothes and shoes and had no coat, which was surprising in view of the very cold weather. She seemed to be accompanying one of the professors, and the hostess assumed she was his wife. Later, the woman came to the kitchen and asked if she could help. The hostess declined her offer and never saw the strange woman again. She later talked about her to some of the guests, but no one else had seen her. It was three years before the mystery was solved. The hostess happened to see a magazine article about the painter Mary Gennetz, who had died in 1943, 34 years before. She recognized her from her self-portrait and photographs. Mary Gennetz had once lived in the flat where the reception was held. She had been interested in spiritualism and had held seances in the flat. The present occupant had already noticed presences there before she saw Mary Gennetz. A woman living in a farmhouse at Thatcham, Berkshire, England, heard a woman's voice say very loudly in a local accent, Mind my pie! She was in the pantry at the time and was alone in the house. Several months later, her mother, who was visiting, saw the ghost of a woman pushing a pram and accompanied by two small children, but her daughter, who had heard the ghostly voice, could see no one. Her mother had not been told about the voice. In a pub at Bourne, Lincolnshire, England, it was a baby's crying that was heard. This one was mentioned on the last episode in a briefer form. The publican's wife had a new baby, but she was sure it was not her baby that she heard crying. However, for obvious reasons, she told no one about the ghostly crying until her mother, who also lived there, remarked that she had heard another baby crying. They discovered that they did not necessarily hear it at the same time, and this, together with the fact that there were no houses adjoining the pub, helped to rule out a living baby as the source of the crime. During the 1973 night shift, workers at a factory in Soham, Cambridgeshire, England, heard mysterious voices and saw shadowy shapes, while in 1974, an early morning cleaner at a factory in Dunstan, Tyne and Weir, England, heard an awful scream, toilets flushing by themselves and locked doors banging. Workers claimed to have heard Maria being shouted and other strange sounds. Some people have heard ghostly singing. In Monkstown, Dublin, Ireland, in 1977, numerous people heard a man's voice singing Danny Boy and Old Man River in the middle of the night. And at the time it was happening, they heard it every other night, sometimes fainter, sometimes louder. At the time of the full moon, it was louder and was heard nightly. On October 27, 1974, in Avalie, Essex, England, after visiting relatives, John and Sue Day and their children were on their way home. Their attention was drawn to a blue oval light that first paced their car and then passed in front of them. At about 10.10 10 p.m. and close to home, the Days lost sight of the object behind some high bushes on the right-hand side of the road. But suddenly the Days felt that something was wrong. The sound of their car vanished and the radio crackled and smoked. Then, just before their headlights went out, they spotted a block of green mist on the road just ahead of them. The car jerked as it entered the mist, and after what seemed like a moment of silence and coldness, it emerged. A few minutes later, they had arrived home, but it was 1 a.m., nearly three hours later than it should have been. Under hypnosis three years later, John Day revealed that while in the green mist, his family and their car had been teleported up a column of light into a craft where they underwent medical examinations at the hands of a couple of four-foot-tall beings wearing loose white gowns. These necklace and slightly hunched-over creatures had animal-like faces, with large triangular eyes and large pointed ears. Short fur covered all their visible body parts, and their hands had four clawed digits. Occasionally, the creatures made chirping sounds. These beings seemed subservient to another set of beings aboard the ship, who stood about six and a half feet tall and wore suits that covered their hands and formed hoods over their heads. Though their mouths and ears were not visible, they looked nearly human, with the exception of their pink eyes. These taller beings seemed to run the show and escorted John and Sue on a tour of their three-level craft. During this tour, the days were given an explanation of the ship's propulsion system and shown a holographic movie of space that included the destruction of the alien's home planet by pollution. The car and family were then returned to a spot on the road about half a mile from where they had been abducted. The family members reportedly underwent some major personality changes in the months following their encounter. 66-year-old actor Kurt Russell claims he was the person behind the first call to report the 1997 Phoenix Lights UFO phenomenon. Russell told the BBC in late April that he was flying the Arizona skies with his son Oliver when he decided to make the phone call after being unable to identify the object. Thousands of eyewitnesses called law enforcement that night as the alleged mothership UFO slowly cruised the desert sky. Quote, I saw six lights over the airport in absolute uniform, in a V-shape. I was just looking at them and I was coming in. We were maybe half a mile out. Oliver said, Pa, what are those lights? Then I kind of came out of my reverie, and I said, I don't know what they are. He said, are we okay here? And I said, I'm going to call, and reported it. They said, we don't show anything. 
Former Arizona Governor Fife Symington initially mocked the incident at our press conference, but later admitted that what he saw was something that defied logic and that it even challenged his reality. According to Marius de Wilde in Quarobel, northern France, on the night of September 10, 1954, he was reading a newspaper while his wife was watching television when they heard their dog Kiki barking incessantly. Initially, the man dismissed the pet's alert and went back to his pastime, but the dog kept barking and de Wilde became concerned. What's going on, he asked his wife, realizing she wouldn't be able to produce an immediate satisfactory response about what was causing the ruckus anyway. Equipped with just a battery-operated flashlight and leaving his spouse behind in the room with the TV still on, he ventured out into the night to investigate. The night, he said, was very dark, so he had to use the flashlight to find his dog. The animal was terrified. I told him to shut up and stop barking, but then he started growling, DeWilde told the astonished gendarme. And they went towards the right side of the house, which is surrounded by a four-foot fence I made in order to prevent kids and my dog to come across the railroad. As I walked to the fence, I saw a large thing that called my attention, about 20 feet away. At first, I figured it was just a wagon or something, but then I realized it wasn't possible for a train to just stop there at that particular spot. It was then that DeWilde heard the same noises the dog had been alerting him about earlier, only this time the noise was close right behind him. And I thought they were some thugs, as this is the route you usually take in order to get to Belgium. My dog went crazy and began barking and growling again. Then he notes shadows began to approach him. The shapes he saw were so small he reported that he thought they were children. So I pointed my flashlight at them and I jumped back when I saw the beam of light being reflected back at me when I pointed it right at the head of that thing. It was like a helmet in a mirror, they were very small. At that moment, a beam of light allegedly came out of the wagon-like object he had seen earlier, which left him completely paralyzed. His entire body, he recollected, felt numb, so he wasn't able to run away or even scream, although he said his mind was clear and he could see everything that was happening. I'm there seeing these things walking from one place to another over the sidewalk. As they approach me, I notice that they don't have arms. The creatures are short, probably 3 feet and 30 inches tall. Their feet are big, very big, and their heads were covered with helmets that looked as if they were part of their attire, like joined in just one piece. So they keep coming towards me, and I start feeling dizzy. Then I hear the sound of a door being opened. I somehow am able to turn my head slightly to the right and take a look at the wagon, and I notice there is indeed an open door on it. Immediately, the things entered the wagon, and it began hovering about 40 feet up. Seconds later, the object turned bright orange, almost red, before disappearing into the dark skies. The world was now recovered and able to move again. When he went back inside the house to tell his wife, she explained she hadn't seen or heard anything. He then went to his neighbors, but he obtained the same response. Surprisingly, he was the only witness to the incredible event that had just taken place just a few feet away. Startled and concerned, he decided to call the local police, but when they arrived, he began feeling sick every time they approached the exact spot where the incident occurred. The official investigation went on, and strange things started to happen. Trains began making abnormal noises, phones stopped working, and electronic devices such as the flashlight DeWilde had been previously carrying were no longer functional. A 20-feet depression was found on the exact point where the object had landed, with a few carbonized rocks lying on it. Days later, the witness began experiencing breathing problems, and his dog Kiki died. In 1991, a woman at a UFO conference in France claimed to have seen the same orange light flying on the night of the incident from a house near De Wilde's. In San Lorenzo, Puerto Rico, a man came forward last Thursday about a decades-old alien abduction he claimed to have experienced in the eastern central region of Puerto Rico. The anonymous man, who maintains he is now an army sergeant with aviation background in North Carolina, says his neighbors also witnessed the incident. I was at the back of our house when I heard a humming noise. I turned around and saw there was a large ship hovering next to a tree, he reported on Mufon. The neighbors at the same time saw the craft and reported the house shaking as it went by and the lights flickering. Suddenly, he claims, a door on the unidentified object opened and an entity stood on it. It was dressed in shiny black clothes and had what I believe to be a mask that made it look like it had a beak, he recalls. What reportedly happened next left the Puerto Rican with a set of memories too vivid to forget. As he observed the entity standing on the door, a robotic arm picked up the young boy and put him inside the ship. After that, I remember sort of waking up in a table and something being put in my back. They told me it was a star, and being a kid, that's what I believed, he recalls, adding that a group of smaller beings were walking around the table. The man says the next thing he remembers was waking up in a grass field located about 600 feet away from where he had purportedly been abducted. The grass had been pushed down like a crop circle type. I ran home and explained to my parents what had happened. He explains that his parents explained to him how their house, just like the neighbors, had been shaking as the flying object arrived. The problem, he says, is that they were not able to gather photographic evidence as they didn't have a camera due to their economic hardship. On June 9, 1954, at 18.20 hours, in East Dandenong, Australia, Janet Brown, 16, and a 13-year-old friend heard a loud noise and saw a large dark object that burst into light, hovering 20 meters away at the height of a factory gate. It was cylindrical, 10 meters long, 5 meters high, with a canopy on top. It flew away and was lost to sight behind some trees. 
On June 21st, 1954, in Ridgeway, Canada, Mr. and Mrs. Guy Baker saw a disc about 14 meters in diameter with a dome and several rotating lights. They had to push their car, which could not be started, until the object left the ground. They found a large brown circular spot in the pasture where the disc had been resting. July 7th, 1954, in Garçon, Canada, a miner saw a landed object and a giant man with strange burning eyes. He fainted. When he regained consciousness, object and entity had vanished. Investigated by the Royal Canadian Air Force. On July 20th, 1954, in Oslo, Norway, near the city, two men were chased by an object and stopped their car to observe it. After the sighting, a watch stopped working, and the paint on the car allegedly changed color. On August 10th, 1954, at 2130 hours, in Hemingford, Canada, the Kupal children said that a brightly lighted object followed them to the farm. Mr. Kupal and his oldest son went to the field where the children had been playing and saw an orange object rise and speed off to the west. Grass was flattened over 15 meters with two tracks about 5 meters long. Okay, some strange events from England. Off Gorleston in Norfolk, dredger struck submerged solid object 30 miles offshore, but when it went back using echo sounders, no object could be found May 1975. In Hunstanton, during violent thunderstorm, partly fused bar of iron fell from sky, striking chimney 1930. Norfolk broads, possible case of spontaneous human combustion, 29th July 1938. Now in Nottinghamshire, caught grave colliery, miner saw a ghost underground. At Rufford Abbey, ghost and monks have it, and carrying crucifix seen by soldier on guard duty, spring 1942. Now in Magdalen College, Oxford, Oxfordshire, students heard and saw ghosts in their rooms, spring 1987. Now near Bridge North, Shropshire, couple out walking saw phantom ruined building, 21st September 1978. Another phantom building. In Chatwall, ghostly horse and rider scene, Easter 1965. Now in Somerset, in Bridgewater, Charred peat or compost found at garden after witness saw bright object descending and heard loud noise, summer 1978. Now in Witchinger Barton, 12-inch long red-hot cylinder crashed through house roof, no planes flying over at the time, September 1987. Now in South Yorkshire, in Kilnhurst, mysterious message found a cassette tape, August 1986. In Rotherham, noises heard in apparition seen in haunted flat, August 1986. In Silverwood Colerty, near Rotherham, miner at coalface saw ghost date unknown, probably 1970s or 1980s. At Stockbridge, ghost seen on new bypass, September 1987. Now in Staffordshire, at Alton Towers, in Deer Park of Stately Home, man saw millions of frogs, half inch long, falling from sky for at least one and a quarter hours during World War II. In Suffolk, at Lincoln Heath Air Force Base, ghost seen, including phantom RAF pilot who hitched a lift, February 1951. Now in Dunstan, cleaner heard scream in factory's haunted toilet, and workers heard voice, autumn 1974. Now to the West Midlands, in Aston, Birmingham, warm and sticky rock fell from the sky, 12th May 1969. Near Coventry, man walking in country lane saw soap bubbles moving against the wind, summer 1952. In Oldbury, pupils at grammar school saw ball lightning during thundery weather. Spherical, glowing object drifted in through window. It was yellowish, off-white, and resembled a giant glowing thistledown, more than six inches in diameter. After ten seconds, it touched a metal desk leg and vanished silently, leaving no smell, early 1940s. What the hell are God's neighbors going down? That was a public service announcement designed to scare the shit out of me. I mentioned earlier that most of the alien beings I experienced appeared to be of typical, well-known types, but also that not all of them were. One time, I encountered a spirit which was a tall, bald woman in a simple toga or robe. She was very friendly and would remove parasites from me in a very loving manner. She exuded a feeling of warmth, happiness, and care. When I asked her about herself, she pulled my hand to a book on Mars mysteries. She agreed that she was indicating that she is a human spirit from Mars. That was surprising. Quite unexpected. I later found out that many people think that an ancient human civilization lived on Mars a very long time ago. I also met two very tall, rather imposing humans who, I was told, were of a rather lesser-known type of Nordic. One of the reasons they are lesser-known is because they are not directly involved in abduction and contactee activities. Nordics are known to have blonde hair, but these guys were pale and bald. They were very dour and serious, but were helpful and kind. When they would work parasites out of me, they would form dark, frightening-looking suits around their entire bodies that would then make them look like biomechanical monsters from an H.R. Giger painting. One time, Listening to one of the songs on the Coil album, Remote Viewer, which I highly recommend for spiritual work, I perceived two very large insect beings buzzing into the room. They were about as big as a medium-sized dog, and were flying around on typical insect wings. They swooped down on me and began working parasites out of my body. 
I could see their segmented appendages working very quickly and efficiently. It reminded me of a bee doing their thing on a flower. They finished their work and buzzed back out of the room. When I asked my spirits about it, they said that the beings were biomechanical creations of the visiting bald Nordics. When I asked my spirits more about them, they told me that if the blonde Nordics are related to elves in human fiction, then these guys are related to dark elves. They are generally more subterranean than their blonde cousins. They are masters of genetic engineering and biotechnology. While they don't take part in human abductions themselves, many of the biomechanical devices, beings, and suits described by abductees were created by them. They also have something to do with the creation of viruses and bacteria which have taken countless human lives. Most of them tend to be without moral concern. They're the masters of what they do, and they don't really care what their clients do with their creations, even if it means aiding in genocide. However, the two that visited me were of a more benevolent nature than most of their people. They have been reincarnating as human beings in greater numbers recently. Many people in the whole goth industrial scene are reincarnated dark elves, so to speak. I mentioned H.R. Giger before, one of my personal favorite artists, and I am told that his artwork is, in ways, a subconscious channel of the aesthetics of the dark elves. They are most closely represented or reflected in our fiction as, well, from what I've seen, the Dark Elves in the Elder Scrolls universe, who are rather dour, create many of their homes and armor out of animal bones and shells, and are masters of genetically engineering giant mushroom homes. The uh, Dark Elves in the movie Thor the Dark World, with their dark organic architecture and full body armor, but most especially the engineers in the movie Prometheus, with their tall, pale, bald, idealized human appearance, genetic engineering, bioweapons, dark organic architecture, biomechanical full body suits, and their role in shaping the human race. In fact, my spirits insist that Prometheus was subconsciously influenced to represent those guys. He was abducted by aliens earlier this afternoon. That little girl got lost under the bed and she went into an alternate dimension. This article is called Another Interesting Leak. A second NASA scientist tells us that somebody else is on the moon. It was posted to CollectiveEvolution.com on January 2nd, 2016 by Arjun Walia. Today, a number of people have become aware of the fact that not all of what goes on behind the scenes is made public. This is precisely why the Freedom of Information Act was created. It's a federal freedom of information law that allows for the full or partial disclosure of previously unreleased information and documents controlled by the United States government. There are still many obstacles in the way of full transparency, one of which is the use of national security to keep information classified and hidden from public viewing. This has become more evident with the revelations offered by WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden, but the problem goes deeper still. Did you know that the U.S. government classifies roughly 500 million pages of documents every single year? Multiple NASA personnel have made some pretty shocking claims about the moon. George Leonard, a NASA scientist and photo analyst who obtained various official NASA photographs of the moon, many of which he published in his book, Somebody Else is on the Moon, is just one of these people. Although the photos are small and the resolution isn't up to today's standards, they show details of original massive prints. While Leonard published the identifying code numbers of the photos in his works to back up their source, we still can't say for sure that they were real, and their poor resolution only makes matters worse. Far more compelling than these photos are his statements about what was found on the moon, along with its verified NASA credentials. Leonard was not the only one with a credible background trying to tell the world the truth regarding the moon in the photos that were taken from the Apollo missions. This quote is from Bob Dean. Ladies and gentlemen, my government, NASA, which many of us in the United States say stands for never a straight answer, proceeded to erase 40 rolls of film of the Apollo program. The flight to the moon, the flight around the moon, the landings on the moon, the walking guys here and there. They erased, for Christ's sake, 40 rolls of film of those events. Now we're talking about several thousand individual frames that were taken that the so-called authorities determined that you did not have a right to see. Oh, they were disruptive, socially unacceptable, politically unacceptable. I've become furious. I'm a retired command sergeant major. I was never famous for having a lot of patience, end quote. Bob Dean is a retired U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major, and he also served at the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe of NATO as an intelligence analyst. When it comes to the UFO phenomenon, we now have public disclosure of thousands of documents along with hundreds of credible witness testimonies, but that is a separate topic. It's also important to note here that the Russian government recently called for an international investigation into the U.S. moon landings regarding the disappearance of film footage from the original moon landing in 1969. They are also referring to the approximately 400 kilograms of lunar rock obtained during multiple missions between 1969 and 1972. Leonard argued that NASA knew about extraterrestrial activity on the moon and attempted to hide that information. He's not the only one to make such an assertion. It's a quote from Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. 
read the books, read the lore, start to investigate what has really been going on, because there is no doubt that we are being visited. The universe that we live in is much more wondrous, exciting, complex, and far-reaching than we were ever able to know up to this point in time. Mankind has long wondered if we're alone in the universe, but only in our period do we really have evidence. No, we're not alone. Leonard is not the only NASA scientist to say some strange things about the moon. Recently, a plasma scientist by the name of Dr. John Brandenburg brought up the issue as well. He was the deputy manager of the Clementine mission to the moon, which was part of a joint space project between the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization and NASA. The mission discovered water at the moon's poles in 1994. According to Brandenburg, in an interview from his documentary, it was the Clementine mission, a photo reconnaissance mission, basically to check out if someone was building bases on the moon that we didn't know about. He then went on to state, Of all the pictures I've seen from the moon that show possible structures, the most impressive is a picture of a miles-wide rectilinear structure. This looked unmistakably artificial, and it shouldn't be there. As somebody in the space defense community, I look on any such structure on the moon with great concern because it isn't ours. There's no way we could have built such a thing. It means someone else is up there, end quote. If you were to tell the average person that you think another civilization advanced enough to have mastered space travel and had been to the moon before we got there, and is possibly still going there, you would without a doubt receive some very peculiar looks in return. On the other hand, if that other person were to decide to hear you out, you would probably get their attention pretty quickly. For some, this type of information can be overwhelming, even terrifying, and that's okay. Many people are not ready to open their minds up to these possibilities, but the truth of the matter is it's something we are going to have to confront eventually. We are clearly heading toward the inevitable reality of extraterrestrial contact, that is, if we smarten up and start taking care of our planet to the best of our ability. Perhaps we can make it long enough to realize this future, or maybe it's coming sooner than we think. Time has come to see the world as it is. This article is My Ketamine Journeys, or Ketamine in the Enchantment of Other Worlds, by Stanislav Groff. It was posted to realitysandwich.com in 2017. The following essay is excerpted from The Ketamine Papers, edited by Phil Wolfson, MD, and Glenn Hartelli as PhD, and published by MAPS. In the fall of 1972, I was introduced to the strangest psychoactive substance I have ever experienced in the 50 years of my conscious research. The effects of this compound are so extraordinary that they stand out even in the group of psychedelics, drugs for which the German pharmacologist Louis Lewin coined the term Fantastica. This substance was ketamine. The person who brought the remarkable psychoactive properties of ketamine to the attention of our staff at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center was Salvador Roquette, a controversial Mexican psychiatrist known for his wild experimentation with psychedelics. Roquette used to conduct sessions with large groups of people to whom he administered a variety of psychoactive substances, LSD, psilocybin, peyote, datura, and others, while exposing them to movies with shocking, aggressive, and sexual content. His intention was to induce in his clients profound experiences of ego death, followed by psycho-spiritual rebirth. The purpose of his visit in Baltimore was to participate in our LSD training program for professionals. Ketamine was discovered by Cal Stevens of Wayne State University in 1961. It has the reputation of being an unusually safe anesthetic because it has minimal suppressive effects on circulation, breathing, and the cough reflex. It gained great popularity among medical personnel as an anesthetic that was heavily used on the battlefields of Vietnam. Today, ketamine continues in widespread use as an anesthetic and analgesic in human and veterinary practices, despite what has been termed the ketamine-induced emergence syndrome, which some patients have reported as they awaken from surgery. In other words, these are the same effects as when given deliberately at sub-anesthetic doses to elicit psychedelic experiences. Those members of our staff who had heard about ketamine before Roquet's visit knew that it was a substance used as a general anesthetic and had heard about the emergence syndrome as an untoward complication of ketamine administration that was sometimes treated by administration of tranquilizers. In his presentation to our staff, Roquet introduced an entirely new perspective. He explained that the emergence syndrome was not a side effect of ketamine, but part of its fascinating principal effect. Ketamine was a dissociative anesthetic and its mechanism of action was radically different from other commonly used anesthetics other than nitrous oxide. At sub-anesthetic doses, administration of the substance did not lead to loss of consciousness, but to a dose-related progressive reduction of sensory awareness of the body. He helped us to understand that as anesthesia wore off, patients were experiencing fantastic voyages through a wide range of other realities. Extraterrestrial civilizations and parallel universes, the astrophysical world and the micro world, the animal, botanical, and mineral kingdoms, other countries and historical periods, and archetypal domains of various cultures. This was the nature of the unbidden and confusing emergence effect that patients were not prepared to experience coming out of anesthesia. In contrast, Roquet's clients, who had not taken ketamine as an anesthetic, but as a therapeutic agent and a vehicle for philosophical and spiritual quest, had profound mystical experiences, and many of them believed that they had encountered God. Some of them were also convinced that they had visited the Bardo, 
the intermediate realm between incarnations, and claimed that they had lost fear of death. For several members of our staff, including myself, Roquet's lecture generated intense curiosity and a strong desire to have a personal experience with ketamine. Roquet happened to have with him an adequate supply of the substance and offered to conduct training sessions with those of us who were interested. Our personal experiences fully confirmed Salvador's report. Ketamine clearly was a fascinating substance that was of great interest to anybody seriously interested in consciousness research. Although its effects were very different from LSD, there was no doubt that it was an important contribution to the armamentarium of psychedelic substances. The astonishing nature of ketamine experiences required lying down and journeying for periods of time without much interpersonal contact or ability to be in sensory contact with external reality because the sensory modalities were very diminished, particularly the visual, proprioceptive, and tactile. Over the years, I continued my personal experimentation with ketamine and did not cease to be astounded by the extraordinary nature of the experiences and the profound insights that they provided concerning the relationship between consciousness, the human psyche, and matter. The effects of ketamine have always been utterly unpredictable, even in the broadest sense. In my experimentation with other psychedelics, I usually had at least a rough idea of where I was in my self-exploration and what might come. Biographical exploration, reliving of birth, archetypal experiences, etc. The ketamine experiences were like visits to a cosmic Disneyland. I never knew what might come, what the ride would be about, and the experiences covered a wide range from the most sublime and astonishing to the completely banal and trivial. I will give at least a few examples to illustrate what I mean. A good point of departure is ketamine's great potential to mediate astral projection. Some of these experiences are fairly straightforward. Others have certain features that are bizarre and absurd, as we will see from the following examples. One evening, I took ketamine in our house in Big Sur at a time when we were conducting one of our month-long seminars at Esalen. At one point during the session, I realized that the experience had taken me to the Big House, a part of Esalen, about a mile from our house, where all the group activities of the month-long seminar took place. I saw in great detail several of the group members involved in social interaction. The next day I was able to verify the accuracy of my perception, but at the time when I was witnessing these events, I experienced myself as a pillow in the corner of the room in the big house, my body image taking on completely the shape of this object. On another occasion, I had a similar experience, only even more extraordinary, since this time Christina shared it with me. In the middle of a joint ketamine session we were having in the bedroom of our Big Sur house, I found myself suddenly in the Esalen bath and realized that I had become a wet towel hanging over the railing overlooking the ocean. From this perspective, I was able to witness in detail what was happening there and correctly identify the people who were in the bath at that time. Toward the end of the session, I described this bizarre episode to Christina and was astounded to find out that she had exactly the same experience. The following morning, we were able to verify the accuracy of our joint experience by talking with the people involved. As the above examples indicate, one of the extraordinary and characteristic aspects of the ketamine experience is the surprising possibility to identify experientially with various material objects and processes that we ordinarily consider unconscious because they are inorganic and we associate consciousness with higher forms of life. Innate experiences of this kind are very frequent in ketamine sessions and when they happen, they seem very authentic and convincing. They make it easy to understand the animistic worldview of many native cultures, according to which not only all animals and plants, but the sun and the stars, the oceans, the mountains and rivers, and other parts of inorganic nature are all conscious. Among my many memorable experiences of this kind were identification with the consciousness of the ocean, of the desert, of granite, of an atomic reactor in a submarine under the Arctic ice, of a metal bridge crossed by heavy trucks, of wooden stakes being driven into the earth by hits of giant mallets, of burning candles, of the fire at the end of a torch, of precious stones, and of gold. My list includes even identification with a ski boot on the foot of a cross-country skier attached to a ski and experiencing all the shifting tensions associated with the movements involved. Equally frequent are experiences of identification with various other life forms. In one of my ketamine sessions, I became a tadpole undergoing a metamorphosis into a frog, and in another one, a giant silverback gorilla claiming its territory. And on several occasions, this mechanism provided for me extraordinary insights into the world of dolphins and whales. An additional example was what seemed to be absolutely authentic and believable experiential identification with a caterpillar building a cocoon and dissolving into amorphous liquid from which then emerged the form of a butterfly. A particularly impressive experience of this kind was becoming a Venus flytrap, a carnivorous plant in the process of catching and digesting a fly complete with gustatory perceptions that my human imagination could not possibly have conjured up. The above examples of fantastic experiences contrast sharply with several of my ketamine sessions that were absolutely trivial and outright boring. I spent them by seeing endless images of brick walls, cement surfaces, and asphalt streets in the suburbs of large cities, or displays of ugly fluorescent colors, questioning why I had ever taken this substance. There was a period in my life when I had several consecutive ketamine sessions that were so horrible and disgusting that I was determined never to take the substance again. 
They revolved around the problem of fossil fuels and the curse they represent for life on our planet. Here is the account of one of those sessions. The atmosphere was dark, heavy, and ominous. It seemed to be toxic and poisonous in a chemical sense, but also dangerous and evil in the metaphysical sense. Initially, I experienced it on the outside and as part of my environment, but gradually it took over and I actually became it. It took me a while to realize that I had become petroleum, filling enormously large cavities in the earth. While I was experiencing identification with petroleum as physical material, including its penetrating smell, I realized that I was also an evil, metaphysical, or archetypal entity of unimaginable proportions. I was flooded with fascinating insights, combining chemistry, geology, biology, psychology, mythology, history, economics, and politics. I suddenly understood something that I had never thought about before. Petroleum is fat of biological origin that got mineralized. It means that it had escaped the mandatory cycle of death and rebirth, recycling that the rest of the living matter is subjected to. However, the element of death was not eliminated in this process, it was only delayed. The destructive plutonic potential of death continues to exist in petroleum in a latent form as a monstrous time bomb awaiting its opportunity to be released into the world. While experiencing what I felt was consciousness of petroleum, I saw the death intrinsic to its manifesting as the evil and killing resulting from the greed of those who seek the astronomical profits that it offers. I witnessed countless scenes of political intrigues, economic scams, and diplomatic shenanigans motivated by petrodollars. I saw countless victims of wars fought for oil laid on the sacrificial altar of this evil entity. It was not difficult to follow the chain of events to a future world war for the dwindling resources of a substance that had become vital for the survival and prosperity of the industrialized countries. It became clear to me that it was essential for the future of the planet to reorient the economy to solar energy and other renewable resources. The linear policy of plundering the limited deposits of fossil fuels and turning them into toxic waste and industrial pollution was so fundamentally wrong that I could not understand that economists and politicians did not see it. This short-sighted policy was obviously totally incompatible with the cosmic order and with the nature of life, which is cyclical. While the exploitation of fossil fuels was understandable in the historical context of the Industrial Revolution, its continuation, once its fatal trajectory was recognized, seemed suicidal, murderous, and criminal. In a long series of hideous and most unpleasant experiences, I was taken through states of consciousness related to the chemical industry based on petroleum. Using the name of the famous German chemical industrial complex, I referred to these experiences as IG Farben consciousness. It was an endless sequence of states of mind that had the quality of aniline dyes, organic solvents, herbicides, pesticides, and toxic gases all hostile to life. Besides the experiences related to various industrial poisons, per se, I also identified with the states of consciousness associated with the exposure of various life forms to petroleum products. I became every Jew who had died in the Nazi gas chambers, every sprayed ant and cockroach, every fly caught in the sticky goo of the fly traps, and every plant dying under the influence of the herbicides. And beyond all that lurked the highly possible ominous future of all life on the planet, death by industrial pollution. It was an incredible lesson. I emerged from the session with deep ecological awareness and a clear sense as to which direction the economic and political development had to take should life on our planet survive. The series of sessions exploring the pitfalls of the industrial age, like this one, brought me to the point when I decided not to have any more ketamine experiences. But the session that was supposed to be my last attempt at ketamine self-exploration took me to the other side of the spectrum. It was so ecstatic and extraordinary that I decided to keep this door open. Here is a brief account of this experience. I had a sense of the presence of many of my friends with whom I share interest in transpersonal psychology, values, and a certain direction or purpose in life. I did not see them, but was somehow strongly perceiving their presence through some extrasensory channels. We were going through a complex process of identifying areas of agreements and differences among us, trying to eliminate friction points by an almost alchemical process of dissolving and neutralizing. At a certain point, it seemed that we succeeded in creating a completely unified network, one entity with a clear purpose and no inner contradiction. And then this collective organism became what I called spaceship and consciousness. We initiated a movement that combined the element of spatial flight with an abstract representation of consciousness evolution. The movement was becoming faster and faster until it reached what seemed to be some absolute limit, something like what speed of light is in the Einsteinian universe. We felt that it was possible to push beyond this limit, but that the result would be completely unpredictable and potentially dangerous. In the highly adventurous spirit that characterizes this group of our friends, we decided to go ahead and face the unknown. We succeeded to push beyond the limit, and the experience shifted dimensions in a way that is difficult to describe. Instead of moving through space and time, there seemed to be immense extension of consciousness. Time stopped and we entered a state that I identified as consciousness of amber. This seemed to make a lot of sense, since amber is a material representation of a situation in which time is frozen. 
It is a mineralized organic substance, resin, and various life forms such as plants and insects are preserved in it unchanged for millions of years. What followed seemed to be a process of purification through which any references to organic life were eliminated. The experience became crystal clear and incredibly beautiful. It seemed that we were inside of a giant diamond. Countless subtle lattices intersecting in a liquid medium of incredible purity were exploding into all the colors of the spectrum. It seemed that it contained all the information about life and nature in an absolutely pure, abstract, and infinitely condensed form like the ultimate computer. It seemed very relevant that diamond is pure carbon, an element on which all life is based, in that it originates in conditions of extreme temperatures and pressures. All the other properties of diamond seem to point to its metaphysical significance, its luster, beauty, transparency, permanence, exchangeability, and the capacity to separate white light into a rich spectrum of colors. I felt that I understood why Tibetan Buddhism is referred to as Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle. The only way I could adequately describe this ecstatic rapture was to call it diamond consciousness. This state seemed to contain all the creative energy and intelligence of the universe existing as pure consciousness beyond space and time. I was floating in this energy as a dimensionless point of consciousness, maintaining some sense of individual identity, yet being completely dissolved and one with all of it. I was aware of the presence of my friends who had made the journey with me. They were also completely formless, mere dimensionless points. I felt that we had reached the state of ultimate fulfillment, the source of existence in our final destination, as close to heaven as I could imagine. What I've described above were just a few examples of my experiences with the strangest and most extraordinary psychoactive substance I have ever come across. Another property of ketamine deserves notice in this context. Christina and I have taken ketamine on several occasions in foreign countries, in Peru, Brazil, India, and Bali, and discovered that the experiences connected us to archetypal worlds associated with these cultures, with their mythologies, with the psyche of their people, with their artifacts, or in their art. Science can explain everything if we look hard enough. Shut up, science bitch! Nothing is true. Everything is real. Not only is he, like, ruining my life, but with all this god shit that he's into, he could be ruining my afterlife. Yes. It's a sort of interdimensional vagina that somehow appears I can interact with it. Fabric of the entire universe could be torn apart. I know my mind is changing. I'm already too far gone to know what to do. Yeah.